Hello, I'm Shane with AGU Sharing Science Program, and this is a recording of the Upgoer 5 session from AGU's 2020 Fall Meeting. Upgoer 5 is an exercise where folks explain their science in the 1,000 most common words in the English language. And so if you're interested in kind of the motivation behind that or more about sharing science in general, we suggest you check out the links in the description. So sit back, relax, and check out some amazing presentations. Hello, today I'm going to tell you a story about a tiny flying box, a study of upper sky things, very close and very far away from each other, by me and the tiny flying box friends. Here at the big meeting, many of us come together who are all from different places. Using simple words and pictures can help us understand each other. But sometimes we all see different things when we show pictures. I may see something to brush hair, but you may see a part of a building. If I show you this picture, what do you see? Do you see a thing that sits on your head? Or perhaps you see an animal without legs that ate another huge animal with big ears and a long nose. I see a tiny box that will help us fly through and learn about a sometimes forgotten place that sits between the sky and space. This is a story of a little flying box that is about to catch a ride and look at this place where the sky and space meet. Our world has fields that go out into space and help stop lots of bits from the sun hitting our sky. Closer to the ground, we have the sky that has lots of wind. Where the sky and space meet is called the, the I on no ball, no ball. This place between sky and space is like where land water, water that is safe, well, sometimes to drink, meets the big water that is not good to drink and their waters come together. Where the sky and space meet, you have air, broken air, and little bits from the air and from space. How does the air become broken? Little bits can come off kind of easily. Sometimes all it takes is for the air to see the sun. The air bits and broken air are close enough to hit and break each other. Other times, you need falling bits from space to break the air. The bits from space and from the sky want to follow the fields, and the broken air also feels the pull along these lines. The air that is not missing bits likes to follow the sky winds. Everything moving around can make it hard to figure out where the broken air will go. This is, what our, this is what our tiny flying box, the TFB, will look at. The TFB will see what happens to make the broken air go in different directions. With only one TFB, it can be hard to know why the broken air moves the way it does. The TFB may only see a part of the area where all the broken air, air comes together or goes apart. Like the pictures at the start of the talk, it can be hard to know what it shows. Some may see a strange area of broken air. Others may see waves in the broken air. So we work with people who imagine the sky and space on computers. What the TFB sees will help them imagine the world better. Before we can learn why parts of the sky come close together and sometimes far away from each other, we need to finish building the TFTFB. The TFB will then go on a big upgoer to visit where people live in the sky. It will sit there until they have time to push it out and send it on its way around the world. We hope that the TFB will stay working in the sky for at least six months. While this is not a long time, our short-lived TFB will help us better understand the upper parts of our sky. Thank you for learning about, about our tiny flying box, the TFB, and make sure to wave when we hope to fly over your head at next, next year's big meeting. And thank you to all the tiny flying box friends. 
Hello, my name is Priyanka Kushwaha. I'm a postdoc at the University of Arizona. Today, I will tell you about differences in number of tiny living things under trees and open spaces in dry lands. So as we know, it is expected that in coming years, air will become warmer and dry places will get even lower rain. This will make the land more dry for trees to live in. In dry lands, trees do not grow close to each other. Rather, they grow with open spaces in between them. With air becoming more warmer and dry places getting lower rain, trees would die. This would lower the number of trees and make larger open land spaces between the trees. Other than growing trees, the land is also home to tiny living things. These tiny living things change hard food forms to simple food forms so they can eat them. In turn, tiny living things also help the trees to get the food that they can easily eat. With expected tree death in warmer air and low rain state, a change in number or types of tiny living things in the land is also expected. Since trees get their food with the help of tiny living things, their relationship might struggle to work. To understand the relationship between trees and open spaces on the tiny living things in dry places, I want to know if the tiny living things found under the trees and open spaces are the same. My work seconded the work of others that the areas under the trees had a higher number of important simple food forms and the tiny living things were different under trees and open spaces with under tree numbers being higher. Also, the number of different types of tiny living things found in the dry place were different than other places which get more rain, have cooler air, and grow different types of trees. I also matched the number of tiny living things shared between under trees and open spaces. Few number of tiny living things were shared between under trees and open land areas, but the number of tiny living things that were only present under trees was higher than the shared and open spaces number. This could mean that trees need more or different types of tiny living things to get their food and live. So if trees die with their tiny living things, new trees will not be able to grow as important tiny living things needed for growing and continued living are lost. Next, I also wanted to know if the number of tiny living things that change hard food forms into simple food forms are the same under trees and open spaces. My work showed that the number of tiny living things that carry out an important job of changing a hard food form to a simple food form is higher under trees than open spaces. The relationship between the number of tiny living things doing this job and the actual job was also very strong. To end, I would like to say that understanding the job of tiny living things in helping trees to grow and get food is important to study if warmer air will cause trees to die and make more open spaces in trilands. I would like to thank all the people who have helped with this work and the offices that gave us money to carry out our work. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Shane Caulfield and I'm a student working to be a doctor, but not for helping sick people, more like for helping understand the world so we can live better on it. We know that the world is changing because of humans. We've been burning old dead stuff for power for many years, and that changes the air, causing things like warmer days and more or less rain. Those changes matter for all kinds of reasons, and the one that I'm thinking about is all the green life, like trees and woods. They grow where they do because of how warm it is and how much it rains there. In my state, which is all the way to the left by the water, we have a lot of trees, but as it gets hotter and drier, those trees might die. Trees matter because they control some of the water that's in our ground. Uh, they can make fires worse, especially when they're dead. And most important, they take up and help store some of the stuff we're putting in the air that's causing so much change to our world in the first place. I care about figuring out where trees might die in the next hundred or so years. That way we can make a plan to help save some of them or help them move. We also wanna make sure we're not putting too many trees in the wrong places which would make the problem even worse. It's possible to make good guesses about what will happen to trees in the coming years, 
And that's because we have so many facts and numbers about where trees live now. We know where big or small trees can live or where many or only a few trees can live. That has to do with how warm and wet it is in different places. We also have lots of numbers about how warm and wet or dry it'll be many years from now. And I bring together all those kinds of numbers and use computers to help make good guesses about what our state will look like many years from now. When it gets warm, many of the trees may die, especially if we don't help them move to the right places. And if they die, they're easier to burn, and that means we might have more fires. I found that some parts of my state may lose a lot of trees, like the areas closest to the water. That's where we have a lot of rain and the summers don't get too hot, as things are now. That's also where we have the biggest trees in the entire world, which you've probably seen in pictures with their red wood. Those trees are really important and don't live other places, so we should try to take care of them. I've also found that we can avoid a lot of the tree death if we stop warming the world so much. And going from a lot of warming on the right, like if we kept doing things as normal, to a little bit less warming, like if we took some steps to use cleaner power instead, I saw only half as much tree death, which would also in turn help with some of the warming problem. Bringing this all together, I learned that the places where we might be adding more trees today will probably not be safe for trees in the coming years. Instead, we should be trying to save the trees that are already there and be adding trees only in some places like high up or it's going to stay cool enough for them to live. We want to have more trees to help save the world from warming, but having more trees might be harder than we think. It seems like putting more trees in the ground all over is not a great way to fix the problem. Um, there are some places where we should definitely add more trees, but more than that, doing things like getting power in cleaner ways will do the most good for the world. Thank you. Hi there. For my job, I learn about making it easier to keep people safe when hot, tall rock things burst. Why do people like myself enjoy hot, tall rock things so much? Because hot, tall rock things are fun to watch. In fact, people fly around the world just to see hot, tall rock things burst. However, it is my job as a person who studies hot, tall rock things to tell you that bursting tall rock things are not very safe. This is because a bursting tall rock thing throws rocks, fire water, and hot smoke made of tiny rock pieces into the air, which can hurt or kill people or make them very sick. Bursting tall rock things also push thick fire water to towns, which can burn cars, houses, and many other things people have built. In fact, many 10 hundred, 10 hundreds of people, that is a lot of people by the way, live close enough to hot tall rock things to not be totally safe if those hot tall rock things burst. You may ask why so many people live near hot tall rock things. It is not really because they are fun to watch. It is actually because fire water cools off in the rocks that over a very long time become ground that you can use to grow food. This happens because over a very long time, wind, rain, and very tiny living things change rocks made from hot tall rock things into soft tiny pieces of ground that grow leaves. Things with leaves give us food and are also food for animals that many people like to eat. But the sad thing is, for a hot tall rock thing to make this ground, it has to burst a lot. So at some point it will burst in places where people live. People like me who study hot tall rock things figure out what causes them to burst so that we can tell other people when and where hot tall rock things may burst again. For my job, I study three things. First, I look at rocks made from hot tall rock things because these rocks tell me how hot tall rock things burst. Some of these rocks were made from cold fire water like the ones in these pictures while others stayed cold and were thrown up by a bursting tall rock thing. Some rocks are even made from tinier pieces of rock that were carried by smoke before falling to the ground. Studying these different rocks gives me a fuller picture of how a hot tall rock thing has burst before and ways it will probably burst again. For the second part of my job, I use computers that think with lots of numbers to show me how the ground pushes and pulls hot tall rock things until they burst. This is important because fire water from hot tall rock things is made under the ground and the ground tells the fire water where it can go and whether it can go to the top of the ground and jump into the air. So by using computers that think with lots of numbers, I can better guess when and where hot tall rock things will burst next. 
For the last part of my job, I learned how people who often study Hot Tall Rock things talk to people who don't. It is important for people who live near or visit Hot Tall Rock things to be able to trust people who study Hot Tall Rock things. When people trust those who study Hot Tall Rock things, they will want to ask them for help and will trust facts about how to stay safe when a Hot Tall Rock thing bursts. In fact, if you are watching this movie because you are part of a big meeting of people who study the world in space, I made another movie where I talk more about this part of my job. I'll share the beginning of that talk here, but I suggest you watch my other movie to learn more. Did you know that people who study hot tall rock things enjoy talking about them on the computer and phone? You know what I mean. The Book of Faces, the place where small blue flying things make small talk, which I will now call the small talk place, the place where people share pretty pictures, and the place where you can watch movies made just for you, which I will now call the red movie place. The people who study and share stories of hot tall rock things did a very good and hard thing two years ago. They used the Book of Faces, the red movie place, and the small talk place to tell people what was going on with a very well-known hot tall rock thing that lives in the middle of the biggest body of water in the world. For a few months, this hot tall rock thing kept bursting fire water in one place while throwing rocks and hot smoke from the very top of the hot tall rock thing. Because these two bursting places were very far away from each other, the people who study hot tall rock things had to use phones and computers to talk to as many people as possible so that those people knew how to stay safe, either by staying home or going somewhere else. Using the Book of Faces, the Red Movie Place, and the Small Talk Place, the people who study hot tall rock things were able to talk to a lot of people who lived on the bursting tall rock thing and answer their questions. This year, I began studying how much help places like the Book of Faces gave to people living on the bursting tall rock thing. When I do more of this study next year, I'll learn more things that will help big teams of people do an even better job of keeping people safe from not safe things. Thank you. Today, I will tell you about finding space places that are different from other space places using computers that sense numbers and make good guesses. These are the people who helped with this work. Please read their names because they did most of the work. In space, there is a large rock ball where we all live. There are other space rocks and also balls of grouped together air, and all these go around the sun. Around each large space rock and air ball is a field that you cannot see, a kind of space field. Even though you cannot see it, we still make pictures that show where the lines of the space field go. We also sometimes use colors to show that some of the places in the space field are different from each other. Stuck in the space field are also tiny pieces of matter, pretty nearly the tiniest pieces of matter that there are. This shows the path that one tiny piece of matter has through the space field. Even though they are tiny, the pieces of matter are moving very, very fast and they can go right through things and hurt people or computers that go into space. With so many people and computers going to space now, it is important to know how to keep the tiny pieces of matter from hurting things. To study the space field, people build and send spaceships. The spaceship went to the ball in spot six from our sun and the spaceship went all through its space field. On that spaceship was a computer and special binder things. These binder things took numbers to tell how strong the space field is and also how many tiny pieces of matter there are. The pieces of matter go into the binder things and the binder things count them. One hard part about understanding the space field is that it is very strong in some places and very not strong in others. Finder things that look at the strong field have a harder time seeing the not strong field. Also, the number of tiny pieces of matter changes a lot in different places. The place in blue has many more than the place in green. Because the places in the space field are so different, we give each place its own name. Let us call them space place one, two, and three. Space place three is outside the space field, around the ball in space. The space field there comes from the sun. If our finder things are good at taking numbers in space place one, they might have a hard time also taking good numbers in space place three, just because those places are so different. So now we can say what we really want to do. We want to teach the space computer how to tell the finder things what space place they are in. 
so they can get the very best numbers for that place. Sometimes it is not very easy to tell which space place is which. There are ways to look all at once at many different kinds of tiny pieces of stuff, and this helps you see each place better. If you can tell which place is which, then it is possible to teach a computer which place is which. To train the space computer to know which space place is which, you need to give the computer a lot of numbers from each space place, and also you need to tell it which space place those numbers came from. If you use the right computer language, it will learn that those kinds of numbers are what each space place looks like. It is not real learning since it is only with numbers, but it is very fast, which is important because space computers are sometimes very not fast. The computer language did a very nice job learning which numbers go with which space places. It ended up being almost as good as people. Out of every 10, it usually only missed one or less. The next spaceship that we send will be able to, on its own, tell its finder things which space place it is inside. And this will make these finder things very not stupid and able to get even better numbers. If we move far away from all the space rocks and air balls around our sun, there is another space field beyond space place three. Having not stupid finder things to send here is very important. Since it is so hard to get there and so hard to send back any numbers, they need to be only the best numbers. We are happy to be helping people ask about and understand these interesting space places beyond our world. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching my talk. Today, I'm going to try to answer the question, what happens when you have smoke bits and water in the sky at the same time? And we use flying things in computers to find out. So some questions that you might have are, what kind of water is in the sky? Why is there smoke in the sky? Uh, why did we look at the smoke in the sky water and how did we do it? What are some of the things that we saw and what does it mean? So what exactly is sky water? There are different kinds of sky water. There's some sky water that you can see with your eyes. It looks white like the, that sky water. Uh, there's also some sky water that you can't see with your eyes, but you can see it with computers. And this is the kind of sky water that you can feel on your skin in some places when you're outside, but we couldn't stick our hands outside the window. But we did have computers and computer noses can breathe in air and tell how much sky water there is in the air, even when human eyes can't see it. We also had computer eyes that look at different types of light and these computers can see that uh, there's sky water when there are changes in the long light, which is the light that we can't see with human eyes, but it makes a heating. And so we care about the not seen sky water because it changes this long light to make the sky warmer. And the not seen sky water can also become the white sky water that you can't see, which changes the short light, the light that comes from the sun, which will make the sky cooler. So we want to know what the sky water is doing. So why is there smoke in the sky? Smoke comes from different fires. There are different fires that make different smoke. There were fires in a lot of places this year. There were some fires near where I live. There was a lot of smoke that came from those fires. And these fires are usually caused by not enough sky water over many years and uh, what people are doing. There were also fires in the big green place far away where water falls from the sky a lot. And we really wish that people wouldn't keep making fires there so that it can stay green and wet. Fires in the land where there are lots of animals that are really different from the other animals. And this is also from not enough sky water and the changes people are making. In our study, we wanted to know about the sky smoke in another place far away that isn't quite as far away as the place with the different animals, but is a little bit farther than the big green place far away. And in this place, people set fires at the same time every year. So if we want to look at the sky smoke, it's a good place to go because we know there will be fires at that time. And when there are fires on the land, the smoke will go over the big water, which is next to the land far away. And 
we mostly flew over the water next to the land far away. And we had two big flying things. Here's a picture of one of our big flying things. And the flying things had a bunch of computers and some people in them. We named this study oracles, which is a word made up of some letters, uh, letters from inside some words that are really big that I cannot say in this talk. So here are some different days that we flew. There were computer noses, which also tell us if there's more or less of another part of the air that you can't see, but this part of air that you can't see is made when something burns, so it, it's made at the same time as smoke. And so we use this part to say how much smoke there was, and that's the part that's that way. And then how much sky water there is goes that way. And you can see that all the days make a straight line. So where you have more smoke, you also have more sky water. And it's really interesting to us that the line is so straight, and we wanted to know why this happened on all the different days. So we also looked at pretend sky from big computers. And so here we can see the sky that our flying computer saw in the colored line. And then different computer pretend skies from different computers. And we can see that the pretend sky and the real sky looked pretty much the same for how much sky water it said. Um, for how high we flew. And there was one pretend sky that was a lot better than the other pretend skies, and that was the newest pretend sky that came from the group of people on the other side of the big water. And because the pretend sky and the real sky looked pretty much the same, this means we can use the pretend sky to understand the real sky in places where our flying things didn't go. And so when we look at the pretend sky, here's a picture that shows the pretend sky at the same number of feet above the ground. Uh, it's almost as far up as you'd go if you were running a short race. And at the bottom, numbers tell you whether you're over the land or whether you're over the water. And this is the number that was really hard to figure out. Somebody wrote a book about how hard it was for everybody to figure out. So it's the harder of the numbers. So this part is over the land. This part is over the water. This goes later in time on this picture. And so some things that we can see, the sky water over the land changes as the sun makes things hot or the sun goes away. And the wind takes the air that has lots of sky water and it moves it from the land to over the big water. The air moves that way. And you can see that the sky water didn't change much once it was over the water instead of over the land. And you can see there's where our flying thing was. So what did we do and what does it mean? We flew some flying things over the faraway water and we saw that the water and the smoke made a straight line all the time that we were flying. And the pretend sky and the computers matched the real sky pretty well. So we think that uh, the pretend sky says that the air doesn't change with other air when it moves from over the land to over the water. It comes from the land already with sky water and with smoke in it. And so we want to know more about this. It's important to know because the, the sky water can warm or cool the air around it and the smoke that's in the same air can also warm or cool the sky. So if we want to know how much warming the smoke is doing, we need to know what the sky water is doing, how much sky water there is, how long it is in the sky, and how it um, matches with the smoke in the sky. Some other things that we will do is we have more flying times that we haven't looked at a whole lot, but there were in other places and in other times and there's less of a line, so we need to look at them more to figure out why it's different then and understand more about that. And thank you. Hello, thank you for joining me. I'd like to tell you about what my friends and I do and about the pictures and movies that we use to do our work using only the 10 hundred words people use the most often. And they do say that a picture is better than 10 hundred words, so I'll show you some of the pictures and movies that we use. And I hope that in the end you'll see why this is important, and you'll agree with me that our sun, the star, is beautiful and really cool, although actually very, very hot. 
You may know the people that I work for, the US Big Water and Big Sky Group. And you probably know that we have computer boxes that take pictures and smell the air all over this big rock that we live on. These boxes are here on our world and they are also in the space around our world. We have space boxes. We use these boxes and these pictures and these smells to help us make good guesses about what the air on our world will be like tomorrow and for a few tomorrows after that. Will it be hot or cold, sunny, or will there be white soft things in the sky, or will the air be very angry and windy? But did you know that it's not only the air on our world that changes every day? The space around our world also changes every day. And the U.S. Big Water and Big Sky Group also makes these kinds of good guesses about what the space around our world will be like tomorrow and for a few tomorrows after that. Those space boxes that look down on our world also look up at our sun. They take pictures of our sun and they smell the space around our world. And that helps us to make our good guesses about tomorrow. I work with the sun picture taking box on the U.S. Big Water and Big Sky Group's space box. And let me tell you, it takes pretty great pictures. This sun picture taking box has six eyes and all of the eyes see in very much shorter than blue light, light that our human eyes cannot see. Each of these space box eyes sees sun stuff, stuff that is very, very, very hot. And each eye sees sun stuff that is a little bit hotter than the last eye does. This type of our sun looking space box will be in space for at least 10 and five more years. There are two of these space boxes in space now, and two more that will be in space later. Now, if you don't work with sun stuff like I do, you might not know how great our sun is, or how beautiful. But it's not just that bright, boring thing in the sky, I promise. In fact, interesting things happen on the sun every day. And that's why we need our sun pictures and movies that are taken in space to see and understand what's going on. The sun is not simple at all, and we need all of our eyes on our sun picture taking box to really understand what's going on or we miss important things. Just like if we only had our human eyes, we wouldn't know any of this fun stuff. And so really, six eyes is better than two. But why do we need to know what's going on in our sun? Well, as I said before, the air on our world can get angry and there can be really big flashes of light and it can be windy. And things like that happen on the sun as well, only it's a little different. The stuff of the sun can get all turned around. And when then that happens, sometimes it can go pop and it can make a really big flash of light and very hot sun stuff can get float, thrown out into space. Now, if that sun stuff happens to be moving towards our world, it can hit us and bad things can happen here. And that's why we need these very good guesses for what the sun and the space around our world is going to be like tomorrow and for a few tomorrows after that. Now, you might ask what sorts of bad things can happen if this fast, hot sun stuff hits us. Can this hurt me? Do I need to run and hide? No. If you are a person who does not live in space, the sun stuff cannot hurt you. But it can knock out our space boxes, and we all use numbers from our space boxes every day. And it can also knock out big boxes at the end of long lines that carry power from one place to another. So if no one knows that it's coming, you can lose power at your house. But if the right people make these guesses, and if other people who own space boxes pay attention to these guesses, they will know what's going to happen before it does. And that means that they can take steps to avoid the problems with their space boxes before the problems might happen. And that's exactly why the US Big Water and Big Sky Group looks at the sun with our space boxes. We want to understand the sun, and we want to be able to make even better good guesses about what will happen next. And that way, the people who own space boxes can take steps to avoid problems and no one has to worry. I'll leave you with another pretty movie of our sun, taken with one of the eyes on the U.S. Big Water and Big Sky Group's sun-looking space box. Space box number 10 and 6. I think that our sun is beautiful and it's strange and it's interesting and it's worth looking at with our very much shorter than blue light eyes on our space boxes because there is always more for us to understand. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carl. I'm a student. 
uh, I want to thank the people I worked with and who helped me. And I want to say I live and work on lands that belong to the Keech, Tongva, and the Senan people. And my life and work, um, their lands make me able to do that. Where, um, and I, so my talk is drier times kill trees. How do fires change that? Um, so the world is changing. We burn old dead stuff to get power for our cities. Um, when we burn the old dead stuff, it releases smoke and parts of the smoke change our air. Um, those, when the air changes, that uh, changes how hot and how wet the world is. And so we're worried about those changes for trees because trees are important for people. Um, trees control how much water we can get from tall places. Um, trees give people places to have fun and trees can use the smoke parts that change our air. So when trees use those smoke parts, um, that can make our world change less. And trees have done that for the last year, many years. Um, so in my state, which you can see in the picture down on the left, uh, our, my state has been getting hotter and drier with especially with more drier times. Um, we also have more fires. So when we have these fires that kills trees and when we have drier times um, that also kills trees. So in a study uh, I'm finishing, uh, we found that when a drier time comes along, it kills trees and changes the for changes the trees in that place. Um, so that when a second drier time comes along, um, the trees that are that still live there um, can live better. Not as many die during the second drier time. So we wanted to know after there's been a fire that kills trees, do the uh, if a drier time comes along, does that still kill um, trees? in the same way as if, if there hadn't been a fire. So to do this, we used pictures from space um, to look at places where there had been dead trees and to see that. And then we also used pictures that people drew in many ways of places where there had been fires. We used that to figure out how many years it had been since there'd been a fire in all the places in our state where there um, our trees. And we said that if it had been more years um, since a fire, we said those places were older. And if we said if it had been less years since there had been a fire, those places were younger. Uh, so what we found is when a drier time came along a few years ago, um, we had our places where that were younger that had less years since a fire, our places that were older where there had been more years since a fire. So during that drier time, the places where it had been more years since a fire, in those places more trees died than in the places that had less years since a fire or the places that were younger. Um, so some key points, um, as we have known for a long time, fires kill trees, but if a few years ago there has been a fire and a drought comes along, the trees that lived through the fire can also live through the drier time a bit better than if there hasn't been um, a fire there for a lot of years in my state. Um, so uh, because there are all these fires and drier times happening now and probably in times to come, my state will probably have less trees in those times to come. So. Um, it looks like we can do some things to, to keep the trees that we have, but to stop the world from changing, um, we, can't, can't, we can't count on using trees. We need cleaner power, uh, probably more than doing things with trees. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Dolores Knipp, speaking for Kaya Wall, Valerie Bernstein, and Luis Zia at the University of Colorado Boulder. We will be talking about sending tiny life forms to space. Here is our story. To go to far away space, humans will have to leave our home's force field and move through the wind made by the sun and stars. Tiny life forms with some parts like humans will go outside the force field first to test and see if it is safe. If the tiny life forms are hurt or die outside of the force field, then the human trip also could be in trouble. Here are drawings of the tiny life forms and their insides and a space person and their insides. We've formed a group to study when the tiny life forms that takes a space trip will be covered by the force field and or when they will be in the sun and the star wind. The sun and other stars make a fast wind that moves past our home in space and through and across the road to space. This drawing shows the sun, the fast wind, our home, the white body that goes around our home. We want to know if the fast wind might hurt tiny life forms and humans in space as they move with the white body around our home. Humans want to leave our home to visit the white body in the night sky and in time go further into space for a longer time. Here again, we have our home, a space road to the white body in space. Here we are showing the full space road to and from our home to the white body. This trip will take several days. Our home in space has a force field that covers us and keeps the sun's wind out. Most trips to space have been during times when the force field gave cover. However, each 27 days as the white body moves through space, it leaves the force field for several days. We want to send the tiny life forms with their parts like humans outside the cover to move with the white body in, in the night sky to study the well being of these tiny life forms when this happens. A box of tiny life forms will catch a ride to the white body in the night sky when it's outside the force field. Here, our picture shows the sun, the white body in the night sky outside of the force field, our home, tiny life forms with parts like humans, the box they will move in to catch the ride to space. Using many numbers, we figured out the course of the white body around our home each 27 days for the next three years, which we draw here. For how big the force field is, we found all times when the white body in, is in the sun's wind, shown in blue. When the white body in space is in the blue area, the tiny life forms moving with it will be outside of the force field. To help others use our work, we turn the picture over to look at it from above. Here is the white body moving around our home. It takes 27 days to go around. For 16 days out of 27, the white body is in the fast wind. And for 11 days out of 27, it's not in the fast wind. During each 16 days in the fast wind, the well being of the tiny life forms can be studied to help us learn if humans will be safe during a later trip 
and time for a trip to space. This drawing shows the one before with our home, the strong cover, the less strong cover, and the fast solar wind. Those are in easy words. If you like to use less easy words, here is a picture that you can look at. Our new story is that we will send tiny life forms with parts like humans to far space. They will move through the wind made by the sun and stars. Our, hope, our home it, space has a force field that mostly keeps the wind away from our home. We formed a group to learn when the tiny forms that take a space trip will be covered by the force field and when not. We studied many, many numbers and made pictures to help others. The tiny life forms will spend about 16 days in the fast sun and star wind during each go around of the white body past our home. This is a good time to study them. We know when each go around of the white body is for the next three years. We look forward to more studies. We would like to thank those who helped us, whose drawings are shown here. We would also like to thank those who helped us with this study by providing money. Thank you. Can really old red and white rocks tell us about breathing air on our world a long time ago? Our world has good air for breathing. That's a good thing for big animals like us. But the air on our world has not always been good for breathing. A long time ago, there wasn't much breathing air in the world. So how do we know there was no breathing air a long time ago? Well, because of rocks because some rocks can remember. These red and white rocks can be found in many parts of the world. They're very old. They formed during the time that our world was growing its breathing air. They can tell us things about what happened during that time. Way back, not long after the world first started, there was lots of big water. Inside the big water were things that made black smoke. And these black smoke things made a lot of this stuff. This stuff liked to stay in the water, so it grew to be more and more. A long time later, tiny animals came into the big water and they started to make breathing air. But the breathing air made this stuff turn into other stuff. This other stuff didn't like to stay in the water, but instead, it made red and white rock. The breathing air in the big water then grew the breathing air up above. We can read the red and white rocks to learn more about these old times. The red rocks are made up of tiny blocks and we can look carefully at these tiny blocks. We use big money badass things to see which direction the tiny blocks were pointing in. So what do you think we found? Did we find that the tiny blocks were lined up with the rocks? No. Did we find that the tiny blocks were pointing every which way? No. We found that the tiny blocks like to be just a little bit lined up with a rock. So what? Why should we care about this? Well, it may be that tiny animals helped change the tiny blocks. There is still a lot to learn about these red and white rocks. How can we keep our feet dry and safe from the big water? The answer is to use lots of very tiny rocks. My name is Stuart Pearson, and my friends Alejandra and Claudia help by making my weird word ideas and pictures better. There's a very low land next to the big water. This is where I live. It is a lot of wind, and it rains here most of the time. Now, the very low land is so low that it would be underwater now if people didn't build big walls around it and suck all the water out. 
this is one of the big walls that they made to keep the very low land safe. The big water is going up and up and up and up, and we want to keep everyone's feet dry so that they stay safe for a long time to come. The plan to guard the very low land is to put lots and lots of very tiny rocks along the edge between the big water and the land. When there's too much wind, the big water will make huge waves. These will hurt the wall of very tiny rocks, but if we have enough tiny rocks, then the big water won't get inside the very low land and people there will be safe. It's hard to guess where these tiny rocks will go when we put them on the edge of the big water because the waves move them around. At the top of the very low land, there are some small lands that have water on all sides. Two times a day, the big water goes up and down, and this upping and downing pushes and pulls water through the space between these small lands, and it goes really fast. This becomes quite confusing. Guessing how this confusing water moves very tiny rocks through the space between the lands is really hard. This is my problem, and it's a big one. The most important question is, where do the tiny rocks go after we put them on the edge of the big water? First, we can look at old pictures of the space between lands to see how it's changed. If we know what it did before, we hope we can guess what it will do next. To know how fast the water is going and how many tiny rocks are moving through the water, we can put water counters and tiny rock counters on the bottom of the big water. We left them there for a few weeks to see if they could watch and listen to the water. And our guess was right. The water is going fast, and there are lots of tiny rocks. If we plan to put some tiny rocks on the bottom of the big water to guard the very low land, then we need to know where they will go. We tried to guess this by putting a few tiny green rocks in the water and following the trail that they left behind. We then went around for weeks in a water car trying to grab tiny rocks from the bottom of the big water and hoping that some of them, maybe some of them, would be green. We actually found some back, and I was the happiest eventually doctor student in the whole wide world. After this, I spent many weeks as a tiny green rock counter in a dark room with no windows. This was not as fun as being in the water car. If we learn enough about tiny rock trails, we can even use computers to guess where the tiny rocks will go next. This part is sort of like playing computer games and is almost as fun as being in a water car. There are a few tiny rocks in this story, but how do we keep track of them all or explain them to people? We made a new way to sort all of the tiny rock trails into a picture, which looks sort of like the ones that tell us where trains go. If you want to go from point A to the small land, which trains will you catch? We can think about how the tiny rocks move in the same way. People in many other lands are also worried about huge waves and the big water going up, so we hope that the things we learn in the very low land can help them too. Together, all of these things should help us figure out where the tiny rocks will go after we put them on the edge of the big water, and I hope that this keeps my friends in the very low land safe for a long time to come. Thank you. I have worked on the Big Blue Water for 40 years. This talk is about only one white woman, me, but my hope is that my story speaks to many others and many other women. When I was little, I thought it was sad to be a boy because it didn't seem as much fun as being a girl. I went to the Big Blue Water every summer with my family partly because I had only sisters. I never thought there was something that I couldn't do because I was a girl. In high school, I read about a woman who was known for going deep into the big blue water. I thought to myself, oh, too bad I will never do something that cool. Then I had one of those hit yourself in the head moments. Why can't I do something that cool? And I decided right then and there to work on the big blue water myself. While studying the big blue water, I learned that nearly 110 times five years ago, 
a team of white men made a very exciting and important trip on the big blue water. This was new because they were not going out to fight others or to buy things or to take over land and stuff from others, but to learn about the water and what was in it. However, because a lot of work on the big blue water started with only men, when women started working on the big blue water too, there was trouble. Some men thought it was bad to have women go out with them on the big blue water. Sometimes men tried to keep women away by putting them down, paying them less, and in other ways. The real word to tell what happens to women is not one of the most used words. So I will use the word attack instead. Some attacks hurt their bodies. Some attacks hurt their minds. Many attacks did both. All during my school years, I was learning about how men and women in the type of jobs I wanted were not paid the same for the same work. These numbers are from later than when I was in school, but the bottom line is the same. Pay for women has not yet caught up to pay for men in the same types of jobs I have held. I have gone to school in three states and worked at jobs in three others. In some of these places, there were women in the top jobs, but in others, there were only men. The men at the schools I went to acted worse than the men at the jobs I worked. Teachers in two of the states where I went to school thought they could touch me whether I wanted them to or not, or ask me out on a date even when I was just out of high school. And the teacher himself was a married man. To put it gently, I was not happy that he did that. It made me feel angry that he was coming on to me instead of helping me learn. After my schooling was done, I started my first real job at the Big Blue Water and Air Place, part of helping run the US. When I started, most of the top jobs were held by men. Only the person right above me was a woman. The men in the top jobs spent their time trying to get more money, more people, and more power. They did not spend much time helping people that worked there learn and grow. Even though I loved the work of the big blue water and air place, I wanted to learn and grow. So when a job opened up because there was a new computer very high up in the sky, I left to go work for a small business. I liked working at the small business at first. I liked that the people who bought stuff from us, pictures of the big blue water from computers in the sky, used these pictures to help them catch food for people using less time and less power. After a few years though, I could see that I could not grow there anymore. I would only get a higher job at the small business if the man above me left or died. It also became clear to me that the men in the top jobs there expected me to follow orders, to jump when they said jump, sit when they said sit, in short, to do whatever they said without question. So I became more and more interested in going back to the big blue water and air place. During this time, more and more women were holding top jobs at the Big Blue Water and Air Place. I could see that the Big Blue Water and Air Place was slowly changing to one where both men and women had power and working together was thought of as better than taking over. I think this was at least in part because of more women in the top jobs. So when I saw an opening for a good job at the big blue water and air place, I jumped at it. I was still using computers in the sky to look at small green growing things like where big blue water meets the land. 
I used a different computer in the sky to track how high or low the big blue waters are everywhere. The big blue water and air place had training to help both women and men learn and grow by trying out other jobs for short times. This time, the person that managed me helped me use the training to learn and grow. I was able to get higher paying jobs there because I tried out a top job for a short time and then was able to move into jobs where I managed others. The training really worked. Is everything fixed? No. Even at the big blue water and air place, there is still a lot of work to be done. Before I left to work for myself in Maine a few years ago, I was at a large meeting meant to talk about how to make the big blue water and air place better. This picture is not from the actual meeting I am speaking of, but it is like the number of people that were there. The person running the meeting asked us to tell the truth about what was happening at our jobs. So I asked the room full of many, many people if there was a woman there that had never been attacked at work. Although I did not use the word attack because the right word is not one of the most used words. Still, only one woman, one said she had never been attacked. It makes me crazy to think how many women might not have kept working at the Big Blue Water and Air Place or at any other job because of such attacks. The black woman who started Me Too was right in saying that women often have to put up with attacks, even more often in jobs that are usually filled by men. Some things are better for women now. Many men and women want to know how not to attack people, women or anyone else. Even if they do not know how yet, there are people to help them learn. Have things gotten better for women working on the big blue water? Yes. One of the top women at the big blue water and air place once said to me, never say yes, but always say yes, and. So yes, and there is still lots of work to do. Some people, even in top jobs, still do not think that attacks on women and others that are different are real or that they drive people away or that they happen to as many people as they really do. Too often to women and to women of color. The words that talk about not attacking people and keeping everyone we want together in the places we go to school and work are not even in the 10 hundred most used words. That needs to change. What we say and do needs to change. We all need to talk about these things. I am asking every one of you to help fix this. Be one of the workplaces where they try to make sure every person, even if they are different from you, gets a chance to learn and grow. Help others learn how to do what is needed to get the top jobs. Go to schools with lots of people that are not just white men and ask the students there to come and see your workplace. We can make this even better if we all work at it. Thank you so much for listening. What comes to mind when you think of a big group of trees? Is it the color of the trees? Is it the sound of the leaves under you as you walk? My first thought is the smell of those trees. As sweet and normal as it is, that smell changes our entire world. And that smell, comes from the leaves. You see, the leaves on a tree breathe, just like you and I. 
they breathe in and with it take in some of the tiny, tiny bits that are in the air around them. And then they breathe out and they give out some new bits to the air. The smells of those trees, those are some of the tiny, tiny air bits that leaves breathe out. Now people think a lot about why leaves breathe out these smells. Some people say it's to keep the trees safe. Others think that it happens to let the tree's family know what's going on outside. No matter why though, these tiny smells are in our air and you probably have never thought much of them. But even though the smells are tiny, they hold a great power over our air. When those smells touch other tiny things, they make something new. Sometimes even just light touches the small things and it makes something new. These new tiny, tiny air bits can keep touching others, which means they keep making even newer things. And because each smell does different things, there are a lot of different types of new air bits that can be made. Some of those new air bits aren't good for us though. Some of the new air bits sit in the air and make the world hotter. Some of the new air bits become wet, then sit in the air and make the world cooler. Some of the new air bits make it hurt for us to breathe and others make us sick over time. But sometimes, sometimes the smells touch tiny air bits that are already bad for us and they become something less bad. So the very smells that you're used to walking through can make their better or worse. They can make the world warmer or cooler. They are an important part of the air, both for you and for the whole world, which is why it's important that we study how and why trees breathe out those smells so that we can plan better for tomorrow and for all the years after that. But this is really, really hard. Even after years and years of study, we don't exactly know how the smells are breathed out and we don't really understand all of the reasons that those smells change. We know that as much as the smells of the trees change the world's air, changes in the world and in its air further changes the trees, which in turn changes the smells, which changes the air, which changes the world, which changes the trees and so on. It's it really hard. So let's look at just one tree, but let's say there isn't much water. The tree is sad. At first, maybe the tree lets out a lot more smells, but when the water is kept away for too long, the tree gets too tired to keep making smells to breathe out. Then the leaves have less to breathe out, and so there are fewer smells in the air. But let's make it harder. Let's say there isn't much water and it's hotter. When the trees are hotter, they breathe out different types of smells, and they usually breathe out more. Okay, well, what if it's hot and dry? What happens then? Are there more smells or less smells? Did the type of the smell change? Let's give these trees more food. Then they're happier and they don't have to breathe out as many smells, but it's also dry and hot, but they do have lots of food. So what types of smells and how much of each do the leaves breathe out? Maybe, maybe we can answer those questions for one type of tree. Those answers would be different for another type of tree. Those answers might even be different for the same type of tree if those trees grew up in different ways. This is such a hard problem. It takes a lot of work to learn all of the different parts of it. But that's why there are so many people doing just that. We make trees happy and sad and see how those change. We are all over the world and study all kinds of trees and we work together to help people think about what tomorrow will be like and the day after that and the next hundred years after that. So the next time you're walking through a family of trees, take a moment and remember that those very smells are changing the air of the world. And if something as small as a smell can change the world, so can we. All right, well, that's all from our Upgrower 5 session from AGU's 2020 fall meeting. If you're interested in science communication, outreach, policy, we suggest you check out our website at agu.org slash sharing science, follow us on Twitter at AGU SciComm, and consider joining the sharing science community where folks talk about science and science communication and policy and outreach and all sorts of different things. Thanks again for watching and we hope to see you soon.